What's up, everybody? It's Kev. Thank you for being here. I'm with Sarah Estes today from copytiger.com. Sarah is a freelance copywriter. Um, and you hear me talk a lot about the goods. What does it mean to have the goods? And without embarrassing Sarah, Sarah is sort of my poster child for the goods and what it means to have the goods. So what does that mean? Uh, what does it actually look like? Well, we're going to hear from Sarah about how she thinks about her freelancing business, how she vets clients. One of the key things that I really try to preach and get across to freelancers is that when you're meeting a client, you are not, it's not an audition. This is not American Idol. It's a relationship and you are vetting them as much as they are vetting you. And when you, that simple mindset uh, flip really changes things a lot. So I know Sarah has some things on that she can share. Um, but we're going to start with a recent situation that Sarah was in where she had uh, the ability to pick between three really good scenarios, three companies that wanted her um, full attention, wanted to buy all her time uh, if she was willing to sell it to them. So let's find out what she did in that scenario. Sarah, thanks for being here. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Kevin. This is going to be fun. So I'll let you tell the story. Um, you're in a, in, in one thing I like to tell people is, you know, on this freelancing journey, you're, you're going to switch paths at different times for different reasons, right? And so the quick definition for me of the paths are path one is sort of the the wearing all the hats freelancer, right? You're, 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 you're just out hustling uh, clients to keep your calendar full. You're, you're pretty good at all the things, marketing your business, you know, having prospect calls, closing deals, getting proposals signed, uh, agreeing on money, uh, project management, managing your own time, keeping the, the clients responsible to their end of the deal, right? Um, sort of the most work. Um, path two is what I call the, leave me alone to do my work copywriter it's like uh they they they're great collaborators they're, they just it's like can i just do the thing i'm great at which is write copy and do it with a, a select few really great clients um and then path three is what i call the entrepreneurial freelancer where it's like they can't help themselves from creating systems and and creating trainings and and uh and formulas for things they're always engineering some system and for them, they find uh, freelancing, they're a little impatient for it. And they'd rather just create something and sell that as the way they do business. So with that definition, pretty easy to say for you, um, at least right now, for reasons you'll explain, path two was the, the clear answer for you at this point in your career. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. So... Things kind of changed a little bit for me recently because I found out that I was pregnant and my husband mm -hmm. and I had been trying for a long time to get pregnant. And so once we finally did, it was um, really, really exciting. But I was, you know, I was a freelancer and when these life shifts happen, your priorities change a little bit. And I was thinking that it might be helpful to work with someone full-time, work with the company full-time and be in-house just so that the hustle of finding clients and marketing the business and all of that was was tamped down just a little bit. And I could just focus on work and kind of have a little bit more security there while we went into this first year of parenthood. Right. Yeah. Massive change. And it's like, just knowing you're going to want to change your bandwidth in the direction of um, like you said, parenthood, probably the most important job any of us will ever have. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, let's make sure the business is more predictable than when we're just hustling as a path one. And so exactly. now it's a unique scenario because um, you have uh, one really great client that would like you to come in sort of full-time in-house. You welcome that for a lot of reasons. You really enjoy working with this client. Um, but then all of a sudden two other great opportunities, um, come to you and 
you're now negotiating with, with these companies, uh, being transparent with them that there are sort of other people in the running. Um, they all really want you to choose them, which is, let's just point that out, a really great situation. <laughs> what I call the best problem a copywriter can have, right? It's still hard to choose and have to let people down, but done correctly, that's a good thing for everybody. It just means that the people you say no to go, ah, oh, shocks, really wanted Sarah, couldn't get her. Maybe someday down the line, the relationship's solid. Plus, you also get to refer other copywriters that they can look at, which only boosts your uh, respect in the industry. But there's this other factor of you knowing that you're going to take some maternity leave. Um, and usually there's a 90 day sort of like dating period in any long term arrangement. And you, um, wisely don't lead the conversations with that. Hey, I'm going to need month three off. <laughs> but uh, so bring us to the moment when you had to now reveal this fact and make sure the companies were okay with that. Sure. So it was kind of nerve wracking because like you said, you don't want to lead with that. Um, it's just kind of an odd way to start an interview. Um, you just want to see if you're a good fit to begin with before you even kind of start going into the conversation about limitations and scheduling and all of that. So I had gotten in pretty far into the interview process before what felt like to me, I was going to drop a bomb of my schedule. And what was absolutely incredible is the company that I ended up choosing. And I would like to preface this by, I also told all of my other clients about maternity leave and all that. And yeah. everyone was very understanding. Um, yeah. But when you're going into a new, um, a new, a new job and you're trying to compete against all these people, this particular position was incredibly competitive. Um, I was a little bit nervous that it was going to be a pitfall for me. So when I told them about, my maternity leave, the fact that I was planning on taking, you know, I pitched it as an entire month off. And what was incredible was their response. Their response to me was essentially, that's great. We're, you know, we're totally fine with that. It's within the, there's like a 90 day, like you said, a 90 day kind of probation period, just to make sure that, um, you know, a lot of people can interview well, but you want to make sure that the person can actually do the job. So totally understandable. Um, but they told me that a month seemed a little short and they were like, we're totally cool. If you take two months or three months, whatever you think you need, you can just fill us in as that time comes up. And if you want to, you know, come back part-time or full-time, just gradually move into whatever you're ready for. And that was just incredible. If I wasn't one over at the beginning of the interviews with them, I was definitely one over at that point. Yeah just amazing and again it says so much about this idea of um sort of going in-house and committing to what i like to call a main client like you know going in-house or being quote-unquote full-time um should and usually does mean that that is your main client you are free to do things on the side i, I only know one company currently that i'm helping recruit for that has a rule that if you work with them, they don't want you working with any other client. It's a bad limitation, but their choice, it's their policy. That's fine. Um, but that was, that was a non-negotiable for you. If somebody said, Hey, Sarah, us and only us. So they were already giving you that trust, which again, just a smart thing for a company to do. My take is that I want them going out and doing things that make them smarter <laughs> and better. And, and they can bring that wisdom back to us. But some people kind of have a scarcity controlling mindset around those things. And again, their choice. Um, but then for them to say, hey, and I remember that because you shared the, their response with me, they specifically pointed out, we, we want a long-term relationship with you. Yeah. And if it takes longer to get going for this most important thing in your life, we're here for it. Exactly. And that is really meaningful. And I think 
that just shows the value of having these in-house relationships and clients because it really is you are signing on for a long-term relationship with with this particular client as opposed to when you're in your freelancing business a lot of these projects and people that you're working with are very short term. So it feels really good to know that both of you are agreeing to go into a long term relationship yeah. and kind of the ups and downs of life can happen and you've got a long term mindset. Yeah, and be supported because life does happen. Sometimes like in your case on purpose uh, with effort. <laughs> And sometimes unexpectedly, right? And and to have a, a great relationship with a company who values you and is ready to support you for uh, when unexpected things come along, then it just makes a world of difference. Um, you and I were talking about the, sort of the best way to define in-house because this is such a scary term to so many freelance copywriters. And I understand it because look, the whole idea of uh, entrepreneurialism and, and freelancing is that word free, the freedom of having flexibility, making your own schedule. But let's be honest, too often what happens is we end up with the worst boss in the world, uh, which is ourselves, <laughs> <laughs> because they're relentless and they overbook us. And they <laughs> I used to joke when I was in that that grind Somebody would ask me to have lunch with them. And I'm like, I can't, my boss is an asshole. You know, he's, <laughs> it's no way I can get away, you know? Um, and so uh, the, be the better way to think of it is in-house or full-time, what it really means is a great retainer that is ongoing. You're not signing in blood. You're, you know, uh, uh, every contract has stipulations for how both parties can end it. And it's usually a two week max thing. It's just like, hey, if, if we're going to have a long term relationship and you decide to move on or change, just please don't like disappear one day and leave us in a lurch. Right. And it, it's completely understandable. And on the other side, if, hey, if you're downsizing or, or, or going to have to let me go for whatever reason, at least, you know, pay pay out the month or, you know, give me a chance to, to replace you. Um, talk about the mindset of, you know, for you when you came into freelancing, um, maybe stuff you pulled from your, your work history before that, because I feel like you looked at it differently. You were always about the relationships and you were always looking for a great opportunity, not, not these one night stands. Exactly. Yeah. Um, when I got into freelancing, my goal was to get, I wanted to work with a small amount of clients on a long-term basis. That was really what I was looking for. And because I love building relationships and I like, you know, carrying on, these um, projects that you can really, you're able to see how things work out over time. And when it comes to copywriting, it's good to be able to see the patterns and to really learn a brand's voice and to kind of sink your heels into what they do as a brand. So I kind of had that in mind when I, when I first started freelancing was I was looking for teams and entrepreneurs and people who wanted to bring on a, a copywriter for more than just a short email sequence or something like that. I did some of that in the beginning, but it wasn't my favorite because you're just kind of in and out and right. um, you don't really get to see the fruits of your labor. Right. You know, you're kind of handing over the copy and then God knows what happens to it after that. So uh, what I was looking for from the get-go is those relationships. And naturally, as a progression of that, once you start getting in, in with the team, like I did at, with this one company who was a client um, for a long time, they start to look at you as an integral part of the team. And yeah. so that naturally kind of brings up potential conversations of full-time employment. Yeah, right. It's just a natural progression. The trust is there. They're like, let's get all the Sarah we can get. And, um, and so what have you found... Um, about those like did you have to overcome any mental hurdles as a freelancer where it felt like maybe i'm giving away too much in agreeing to you know go full-time with one client yeah definitely i mean i think i mean like you said you get into the freelancing world because you don't want to be you know tied and bound by a particular boss or a particular company 
And, you know, it is nice to have the freedom of making your own schedule and choosing who you work with and choosing who your colleagues are. And that was a big deal for me too, was I wanted to design my business and my work life around people that I thought were just absolutely amazing people who inspired me. Those were the people I wanted to surround myself with. Yeah. And so, you know, I definitely think that the idea of considering a like W2 full-time job was out of the question for a minute until you start weighing, once you start weighing things and you understand like, okay, if it's a fully remote position where I am not uh, restricted by, you know, some kind of non-compete clause that re that means that I can't work with anyone else and I'm able to make my own schedule and write when I want, it really does just feel like a great retainer. And once I kind of figured that out, then I was much more open to the idea of, you know, going in-house with somebody as long as I could have, you know, other clients and other projects that excite me on the side as well. Yeah. And, you know, um, I love your story because, and I've told you, I've joked with you many times, like, I, I just wish I could clone you. And I, <laughs> I, say, I say that in jest because what makes you special and so many other copywriters special is unclonable. I, I wouldn't actually want to clone them, but make you as recommendable, uh, other people as recommendable as, as you. And to me, th some of those reasons are how you show up, how prepared you are, how relaxed you are. You're just cool to talk to, right? You you, you just, I always describe you as very together. <laughs> very, it, it, and it's just your nature, but take us behind the scenes. Are Is there any parts of that that you've had to learn or old things that you had to unlearn to show up that way? Definitely. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of experience, part of the hardest part of especially like getting on zoom and chatting with people and doing interviews. And, you know, if you're a freelancer doing discovery calls, um, a lot of that can be very difficult, especially when you're first starting out because you're so focused on yourself and you're worried about what you're going to say, if you're, you're going to look good or sound good. Um, I have a lot of experience interviewing, being on the interview side and being on the um, interviewer side. So it's been interesting to kind of break down the walls of being afraid to talk to people. And so my back, I've worked in a few different places, but I was a private investigator for a long time, which meant that I interviewed people mm. all the time, every day, all day long, all types of people. It ran the gamut from, you know, j federal judges to, you know, people on the streets. Mm. And I think when you go through that experience and you have a lot of repetitions of talking to kind of anybody, you get really, really comfortable. So I think that's yeah. helped me kind of move into all of these places where you really do have to be personable and have conversations with everybody and not freak out about it. So. Yeah. That's a, that's a huge one. Um, and, and let me ask you this. So because you've been on the other side of that, and I'm sure you have, have you, uh, what are some moments where you got on with a potential client and it was a no for you? What, what are some of the red flags you would see? Oh, the red flags I would say is just one of, one of the biggest ones is disorganization. Um, and someone really not knowing what they want. It's very difficult to work with someone who has kind of no vision or no clear system of how they want to move forward with working with a copywriter. Um, yes. now of course, you know, some, some uncertainties is okay. You know, like if they're trying, it's still trying to figure out the system and what they're going to do, that's fine. But there have been some interviews that I got on and they really just had no idea how we were going to work together or they had maybe had um, disastrous relationships with copywriters in the past. And when that kind of gets brought into it of like, you know, oh, they didn't understand what I wanted and it all got messed up. That can be a right. little bit of a red flag, too, because sometimes it's if you're not giving correct instructions or giving like a clear pathway of like how we're going to move forward in this project, it can be really hard. So that's yeah. one of the biggest red flags. Yeah. And you just want to go, I'm not your ex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stop talking about your ex. It's our, it's our first date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really good. 
And please. And that's one of the great yeah. things about working with someone with in-house or companies who have a marketing team and have a system. Yeah, You're right. really coming into something that's a little more structured and a little more sophisticated, which yes. is just easier for everyone. And I yes. really, I really like that. Yeah, that that that's been a new revelation to me. And all this evolving as I talk to more companies about how they work, right? Um, the ones who are you can tell so much by by fast action. Um or, you know, like, like steady calculated action. Um, the ones who ask me for copywriters and I make introductions, I always have a rule for both parties. I say, keep me in the loop. I want to understand how this relationship plays out. And I want to learn from, from both sides. Um, sort of like, you know, use me behind the scenes to, to help you unstick anything that might feel stuck to shed light on things, but also to educate me on, how this works well and when it doesn't and what i see the most with companies is if if if, if i send over um i always give them um uh, context before i actually make the introductions right sending you five names here's what i know about the people here's what you need to know here's their linkedin these things and i don't hear back from a week i'm like bad start this is not good you just told me you desperately need con and so there's no way it's going to go better with the the copywriters than it's going with me right now, right? So that's one level of vetting. But in in your case with the client you ended up choosing, um, I think you had probably what like a four four part sort of like interview series. They talk about that so people have an idea of what that looks like at a high level. Yeah, it was. It was there were I believe four interviews. There was a test project. Um, and I actually loved that process. Some people could see it as a negative of like, why can't you just interview me once and we're good to go. But I really appreciated that process because it also gave me plenty of opportunities to see how they worked and how they communicated. Yeah. And, you know, several times for me to talk to the person that I would be working with and working under in that company and, the test project was actually really amazing. And they did a paid test project, which is always wonderful. Um, but it gave me a chance to get a glimpse into what it would be like working in an editorial way with the copy chief and ads manager there. So, yeah. um, you know, what does it look like to get feedback on my copy from this person? And that's something that's really important to me is what that collaboration looks like. And it, turned out that it was really fun and a really great process and I loved it. So, um, but the first, the very first interview, they kind of surprised me a little bit. I thought it was going to be an interview with one person. It ended, ended up being a panel interview mm. with, uh, three different people, which might've thrown some people, you know, some candidates off or made them a little bit nervous. I, I thought it was great because I kind of had a bit of an introduction with some of these people, but yeah, it was like a panel panel interview at first and then a few interviews after that. Yeah. And, and was it the first one or the second one where they were asking you to kind of like critique and optimize an ad in real time? Yes, that was the, that was the second interview. Um, and that was again, kind of sprung, sprung on me in the interview, which I thought, you know, I think it's smart on their part to yeah. make sure that, you know, whoever they're going to work with is actually ready to handle the things that are going to come at them. So um, I was and up for the challenge. Yeah. And that you're not like uh, trying to surreptitiously pull up chat GPT. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Which you, I, it, you have to do nowadays because you never know how people are actually writing right. this yeah. stuff. So it was, yeah, yeah it was a real time copy um, kind of copy test where yeah. he pulled up a landing page and he was like, okay, how would you improve this? How would you make this better? Let's go through line by line, which we did. And we improved the copy, changed around the design. You know, I explained my thinking behind everything. And I think that's really wanted, what he wanted to know is like, how are you thinking about this stuff? Not necessarily, you know, the copy that we produced in that moment, like, is that going to be the control now, but more of how do you think about this? What's your logic behind it? Yeah. Um, as a side note, I was just talking with um, Patrick Beauvais. I don't have my notes handy. So I hope I get this right. But he has a thing where it's like, what it comes down to for a copywriter to become really good is he has to understand and help develop how they 
see, hear, think, and maybe execute was the last one. I can't remember the last one, but see, hear, think, right? It's like you, those are the things that people can improve on. If, if they're not seeing the world through a copywriter's eyes, you know, with curiosity, with it making connections, what, what are they hearing around them? And what are they hearing in the market? Are they truly understanding people's actual desires, not just what they're saying they want, right? Um, and, um, you know, how do they connect things they experience to come up with ideas, right? The, when I talk to high level copy chiefs, copy guru, I remember Clayton Makepeace um, telling me about this in a conversation. It's like, that's when you say, you know it when you see it about a copywriter. And uh, I remember you saying, oh, I was, it's a lot of pressure on that call because none of us really work our best that way. You know, it's yes, like when- yeah. It's like when you you could say an actor's name from your favorite show a hundred times, but then some you get in a conversation with somebody and you can't think of it. And you're like, what is wrong with me? I know this person's name like my own. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that for creatives when you put us on the spot. Um, but you understood. I know what he's doing. He just wants to make sure I think like a copywriter and what I'm telling him. So it wasn't about right or wrong necessarily. It was about seeing how you operate uh, creatively. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's the most important mindset shift to have when you are going through these interviews or these, you know, tests is to understand where the interviewer or the person on the other side, where they're coming from and what they're trying to gain from this process. So, yeah, it was like that, that real time um, copy audit was super nerve wracking because it is like I, when I write, I've been a writer for many years. I go into my cave, I go into my mm -hmm. creative quiet zone. And that is where I write. I cannot verbally process my writing very well. So yeah. having to kind of say when it's like, Oh, what would you change this headline to? And trying to come up with a headline immediately, which is kind of a disaster, but I think it was more of like, okay, well, how do I think about headlines? What am I looking for? What makes a good headline and kind of verbally processing it that way. Yeah, and probably like he could tell from that. Oh, is she really relying on templates and formulas, and or is she, you know, wanting to do the opposite of that so it stands out and it's original and something people haven't seen before? All these little things. So, I what I want everybody. Hopefully, you're 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 stringing together here. So much happens in the in between in these scenarios. Um, think about what Sarah was saying about. Um, having this ongoing back and forth with them, man, people reveal a lot about themselves when you are in a process with them, how well they communicate. Did they give you the right details? Is the Zoom link correct? Um, is the meeting getting changed four times because, oh, so, you know, are, like you said, it's important for you to see, are they organized people? And you, so you're vetting them as much as they're vetting you. Um, we've been saying in the goods, everything is a test. Everything is a test. And it doesn't mean like go be afraid and like be paranoid that you're going to fail all the time. It just means that when, you, when you're operating in a professional environment, do everything right. Be responsible. Don't let things fall through the cracks. If they do, for some reason, step up and apologize because that indicates that, oh, this was an outlier. Um, and if you've been solid on everything else, they'll trust you that, yeah, it's okay. Things get missed, right? Um, it's just so important to, to be ready like that. Is your, does, is your person, is there, is there a moment where Sarah lets her hair down and just like, is it, is a total slob on the weekends? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, you know, there have been moments as a pregnant person. Yeah. You just kind of are a vegetable for periods of time, but I try and, um, you know, get it together <laughs> during the day. Yeah. Do, are, are you regimented? I'm just curious. Like, uh, the, are you, are you a scheduler? Do you schedule your, your next day at the, the end of the one yeah. day and those things? Yeah. Yeah. I am extremely, when it comes to planning, um, I have multiple systems that I use. I'm a tracker of everything and, you know, taking notes and yeah, I've, and I've learned that over several years. Um, I think it's just 
if you're a freelancer, you have to have your finger on the pulse of everything that is happening in your week to, in order to like keep your head on straight or else you'll miss deadlines. I'm a big deadlines person. I don't yeah. ever miss a deadline. And I think that's part of, um, you know, what has built great relationships with my clients is that I'm extremely reliable. And that's something that I take a lot of pride in and scheduling and planning and being kind of obsessive helps with that. I agree a hundred percent. And now you're at a point in your business where you're able to, because you have systems that work for you, you're able to entertain the idea of bringing other people into your business to help you scale in other ways, because, and you'll know if they're a good fit for you, if um, they're able to follow your system or a system that's reliable, right? It, again, yes. now you'll be on the other side of this going, Ugh, kind of a mess, you know, they missed the first meeting, not good, like, you know, so everybody yep, exactly. gets you act together. Um, it's okay to be quirky and and, and a little strange. It, it, people expect that from copywriters, but you've got to follow the pro code in, you know, in the simplest terms as John Carlton first described it to me, means being where you're supposed to be when you said you would be there, having done what you promised to do. Absolutely. It's pretty simple. And, and it's interesting, you said about deadlines, same way, uh, uh, John drilled that into me earlier. He's like, you just never miss deadlines. It's, it's, a, it's absolutely unexcused. And it's right. Um, I know other people who jokingly say deadlines are a suggestion. I think Clayton used to say that maybe Paris has said that it's a little different when you're in, when you, it's, you're part of the, the launch planning. And what they're saying is, Hey, the ad's not ready. We can't. Okay, great. Well, you have the flexibility to move it out a month because it's your list. But when it's for a client, uh, it's, you have to meet the deadline no matter what it takes. And so being resourceful is, is a huge thing on that. And again, setting people up for expectations. This is such a big thing in life, just like you did with your clients with your maternity leave. You have to prepare your family on the other side of that, right? A, 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 in your personal life, um, if you're a freelancer and you're taking on a big project, there's, it's like a full launch and there's a, you have to go to your family and go, Hey, I'm going to be a little unavailable <laughs> over yes. the next three weeks or something. And if you just communicate these things in advance uh, with anybody in life, everybody has context and things are much more forgivable and understandable. Um, you know, so communicate isn't everything communication Sarah at the end of the day it is it is it's everything and it can yeah. make you know it can make everything so much easier on yourself and I think one of the problems I had when I first started freelancing was over promising mm. and thinking that I could do something really quickly and that I had to work out very fast of oh don't you know really evaluate how long something might take you so that you don't ever miss a deadline or you're not scrambling and, you know, give yourself enough time to actually complete the project in the right way. Yeah. Critical. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, speaking of, uh, pro code, I want to respect your time. I know you're busy and you've got, um, a, a tiny human inside of you m <laughs> may need fuel. <laughs> <laughs> Very excited uh, to meet yet another Copy Chief family member. Um, we've had a lot of babies recently, and it's always very exciting. So um, thrilled for you on all levels. Uh, thank you for being a shining example of what the goods looks like on display and sharing some insights today. We'll see you on the showcase on April 10th. And uh, really appreciate your time. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much, Kevin. Bye-bye.